Welcome to Canada's most irreverent talk show. This is The Andrew Lawton Show, brought to you by True North. Hello and welcome to you all. This is another edition of Canada's most irreverent talk show, The Andrew Lawton Show, here on True North on this Tuesday, February 21st, 2023. If you are in Ontario or Alberta, happy uh, belated family day. I don't know if it's a happy family day that you uh, wish people on family day because you don't really see many people on family day except your own family if you're doing it right i believe it was islander day in prince edward island and louis riel day in manitoba but i refuse to wish anyone a happy louis riel day for reasons that will become abundantly clear if you study the history of louis riel and of canada itself and now i'm going to get more of that manitoba hate mail but uh, we also have nova scotia heritage day yesterday i think we probably had some other holidays that i am uh, missing Missing here. Let me just scroll through. I was going by memory. Uh, let me just go through my list. It's also family day in uh, BC, Saskatchewan, and New Brunswick. So pretty much everyone gets a holiday except Quebec, which is, I think, the opposite of how things usually go. But nevertheless, busy show today. I want to continue the discussion in just a couple of moments about the Public Order Emergency Commission's report, which came down the pipeline on Friday. I'll talk about that with Christine Van Gein in just a moment here. And a little bit later, I want to talk about this NBA game, which I did not watch because it's a sporting event and I probably had to confirm before the show what NBA was, but it's basketball, I'm told. And the national anthem was what penetrated from the sporting world into my world and singer Julie Black's uh, little ad lib of one word of the national anthem. She changed a preposition, but it was a rather significant one. So we'll talk about that in just a couple of moments too. But uh, 2,000 pages, ultimately a finding that the federal government was justified in invoking the Emergencies Act. That's what came away on Friday from the Public Order Emergency Commission and Commissioner Paul Rouleau. Not a slam dunk, not a complete vindication, but on the core idea of whether the Emergencies Act was justified, the commissioner sided with Trudeau, and really on the core ideas of how the Emergencies Act was used, the commissioner sided with Trudeau. And there were a couple of little criticisms he made uh, that I, I think were significant, but generally speaking, he supported the bank account freezes, he supported the conscription of tow truck drivers and he supported the overall use of the act itself albeit with the caveat that in his words another reasonable person could reach a different conclusion uh, so there are two big takeaways here number one is that this is not the end of the road as far as emergencies act accountability goes there are still federal court challenges and as we talked about on friday there's still the political dimension of this voters have not yet in any formal way had their say on this chapter of Canada's political history. And then there's also what the report really said and, and going through with a fine tooth comb now that we've had a little bit more time to do so and start extracting what was actually said here, what was actually found and whether it stands up to scrutiny. And for this, we have one of the best legal minds in the country, certainly when it comes to matters of liberty, Christine Van Gein, the litigation director for the Canadian Constitution Foundation. Christine, I don't even want to ask how your long weekend was because I assume it was... Uh, in large part consumed by uh, a bulk of this 2000 page report. Yeah, it's 2000 pages when you include the appendices. So it's not all, uh, it's not, you don't have to read every single one of those pages, but yes, I've spent a lot of time going over this. Uh, it doesn't get better, uh, but you know, this, as you said, is not the final word. This is not the end of the fight over the Emergencies Act because we do have a federal court judicial review that we brought separately, independently. This report by Commissioner Rouleau was brought by, it was ca called and convened by the government, funded by the government. Uh, and this judicial review is completely independent and will uh, will hopefully reach a different conclusion. So we have a hearing scheduled that for that in April. So just on the scope of that judicial review, let me ask for people that aren't as familiar with the case, are you challenging the invocation of the act, the emergency orders and, and emergency measures that flowed from the act or, or both in that challenge? It's both. So it's sort of, 
uh, two things, really. It's that the Emergencies Act was invoked illegally, that the statutory threshold to invoke it was not met. And we can talk about what that statutory threshold means. I have a very different interpretation of that threshold than Commissioner Rouleau does. And that my interpretation is more in line with what most legal scholars across the country view uh, as the correct interpretation. And the other thing that we're challenging is the regulations that were enacted under the Emergencies Act. Uh, those would be the uh, measures that froze bank accounts and that created uh, prohibited public assemblies. And we are arguing that those are unconstitutional. So sort of two, two, two approaches, two things that we're, we're really arguing. So when we talk about the statutory threshold, this was obviously a, a key part of Commissioner Rouleau's report as well. And uh, do I understand from that that this is not a constitutional challenge? It's not about the moral value of the Emergencies Act. It's about whether they satisfied that test that is spelled out in the Emergencies Act and by extension, the CSIS Act themselves. Yes, yeah, so that's closer to what you would say is the way statutory interpretation operates. So it would be an illegal use of the act. That is, that is what we are arguing, that if you, in, if you use this legislation when the threshold is not met, that use is illegal, and that therefore the regulations under it are unconstitutional. But the threshold was important to know for a public order emergency, it's like the, 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 the legislation has all these different parts and they all kind of are interconnected. That's how legislation usually works. But the important thing for your listeners to know is that for the legislation to be invoked, there needs to be a threat to the security of Canada. And that is a defined term in the legislation. It's defined through reference to another piece of legislation called the CSIS Act. And what's fascinating and a huge problem is that CSIS found that under their legislation, there was no threat to the security of person. This is, er, to, 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 there was no threat to the security of Canada. And if CSIS found that under their legislation, there was no threat and there was no separate threat assessment done, how could cabinet reach a different conclusion? It's not reasonable in our view for them to reach a different conclusion. The thresholds are the same. The definition is the same. It's completely a strange interpretation, sort of this Hail Mary, uh, let's see if we can make this argument, this l novel legal argument and get it to stick. And somehow they convinced Commissioner Rouleau of this strange interpretation. We yeah, just and, and I know that we've spent a lot of time on the show talking about this, but I, I think it is important. And, and ultimately it became increasingly clear near the end of those hearings back in, in October, November, that this was going to come down to a debate about the technicalities of, of the statutes and not about the fact scenario, not about, you know, whether there was this previously unrevealed uh, threat that was very explicit. It, it came down to uh, what cabinet believed and, and what these thresholds were. And, and when, you look at the CSIS Act, which I've had the misfortune of doing a number of times now as I've covered this, it doesn't make any distinction between the different applications of it. You know, when it's used by CSIS, there's this threshold, and when it's used elsewhere, it, there's a different threshold. And, and the Emergencies Act similarly does not put a caveat there. It says, this is the definition. It's spelled out right there. So what was the argument that the commissioner found compelling for why CSIS could find there was no threat to the security of Canada, but the cabinet could. It was this notion that different decision makers may rely on different inputs. But in our view, the words of the statute mean what they say they mean. And for cabinet to reach a different conclusion when, in fact, cabinet was lacking a significant amount of information. They did not have a separate threat assessment from, from CSIS. CSIS had concluded concluded there was no national security threat. Cabinet had not even been briefed on this novel legal threshold. Cabinet had not been fully briefed by Brenda Lucky about the existence of um, additional uh, other laws that could have been relied on to resolve this situation, that, that the Emergencies Act was not absolutely necessary, which by the way, is another part of the statutory threshold. So, cabinet reached this different conclusion even though they were further removed from the situation and had less information than than CSIS did so in our view it is not reasonable for cabinet to have reached a different conclusion 
even if they could rely on different inputs, they actually had worse worse information than CSIS did. And I should also point out that even if that threat to the security of Canada is found, there are still additional layers for the Emergencies Act to be justified. That threat has to be creating a national emergency, which has its own definition, and it also has to be outside of what existing authorities available under law are capable of dealing with this. Now, I know your colleague Joanna Barron had a, a great piece in The Hub that really spells out some of the, these legal uh, articulations here from the Commissioner's report, but I, the one thing that I found particularly not compelling from Commissioner Rouleau's findings is that he he really conflates what police failed to do or didn't do and what bureaucratic infighting and you know th this sort of territorial control between different agencies did and what the act itself says which is cannot effectively be dealt with under any other law of Canada so there seemed to be this this conflation of can't do and aren't doing yeah, I, I mean, that word effectively is carrying a lot of weight in this report mm. uh, because what essentially, I mean, one of my friends, Aaron Woodrick from the McDonald Laurier Institute has written in the National Post is using this interpretation that, you know, police not doing a good job, disorganization, lack of communication, th that is just kind of typical of government. That's, that's a policing and governmental failure and incompetence is not the legal threshold for using one of the most powerful laws in Canada, a law that allows cabinet to create new criminal law by executive order. You can't just hand cabinet that power because the police were incompetent. And look, there were a lot of policing failures. No one is disputing that. We saw that. We saw it in the commission. We actually saw it throughout the, the, the protests that the police were not doing a great job. Uh, I'm not a police so I, officer, so I, I mean, I know it's a very difficult job, but there, there's a lot of consensus that the police failed here, but that is not the threshold. The, what they needed was more help from other police, not this extraordinary sledgehammer that is the Emergencies Act, that in fact, they didn't even really rely on the tools in the Emergencies Act to resolve the, the protests. They were relied on the criminal code. So no one asked for this. It wasn't necessary. Things were ultimately resolved using existing law and the threshold of national uh, threat to the security of Canada, that threshold was not met. So I have a lot of problems with this report, but mercifully, we do get another chance in federal court. And just uh, as a peripheral note on that, to my knowledge, there were never any charges laid under the emergency orders, were there? Uh, well, under the emergencies orders, certainly there were accounts frozen. What do you mean by, by charges? Well, no one was criminally charged specifically using any tool that wasn't already in the criminal code, I guess is the question. Well, I, I, I don't believe so. I believe that the charges were for things like uh, mischief mm -hmm. and um, maybe resisting some resisting arrests. Uh, but certainly the power to um, freeze bank accounts was used. Yeah. Well, and that, I, I mean, as we've talked about in the past, didn't need charges and any other and, and, proof and, or recourse or anything like that. Yeah. And the, the tow trucks ultimately were, were could have been used. Uh, there was a lot made about the, the availability of tow trucks and, and that all could have been done using uh, existing powers as well. There was the nothing word that Joanna that. Barron used in, in her piece in the hub that I think is a sadly accurate word is deferential. And, and we've seen throughout a lot of the COVID related uh, cases that have gone before courts, a lot of deference to government, a lot of, uh, you know, use of section one of the charter to say that, uh, you know, the cessation of rights, uh, you know, in section two, for example, are subject to these reasonable limits or so-called reasonable limits. And, and in the case of the Emergencies Act, is there a legal ability for the government to use this report as a substantive part of its argument or does it kind of exist in a box on its own and can't be brought into a jr as as justification no so this is not a finding of liability this has no legal weight uh i mean it certainly has political weights but uh i would encourage the prime minister if he popped any champagne to put the cork back in because we're coming in federal court and we are using a lot of the evidence that was that came up in the inquiry so that's one way that the inquiry 
uh, is relevant to the federal judicial review. Uh, the, there was there's um, a lot of evidence is, is being incorporated into the JR. But the government can't just table this report and say, listen, it was very reasonable. They've already found it out here. No, and, and they can't bring new evidence at this point anyway. So explain to me where you think the strongest argument is in critiquing the Emergencies Act. Do you think it is on that idea that the threshold wasn't met, there was no emergency, it's, it's, and you know, we don't even need to get into the orders because the orders were illegal on that basis alone? Yeah, so I think that my one of the big focuses that we have in our material, we actually do spend a lot of time on on the orders uh, because the orders are a big problem, right? The notion that the government can seize your bank accounts because yeah. you are involved in a protest that they disagree with politically, that's a huge problem. And anyone who supports that type of conduct, uh, I think you need to ask yourself how you would feel about it if it happened to uh, a, a protest that you support from a prime minister who you, who you don't support, because that's that's really what's at stake here. This is a huge tool that gives the government a tremendous power to use against p protests that they disagree with in the future. Um, but yes, I think that the main, the, the big thing that we're gonna be arguing in federal court relates to the threshold uh, and whether the threshold was met, whether uh, existing legal tools would have been sufficient uh, to resolve the protest, we think that they would have been. And the question of what the legal threshold is, uh, which is threat to the security of Canada, as defined in the CSIS Act, not as defined in the subjective opinion of the, this prime minister, and then uh, examining the constitutionality of the measures enacted under those um, under the emergent declaration of emergency, once that's been found to have been illegally invoked. And what's the timeline for that case? What's the, the next key date in, or key step or date in that? So we filed our factum last week. Uh, the government, I think, is trying to bring some new evidence from the inquiry, but we are resisting that. And there's a, a hearing scheduled for the first week of April. So I'm going to be in, in Ottawa, looking forward to heading back after those those weeks I spent there in November. I miss it already. Uh, <laughs> so, so I'm going to be back and I'll be live streaming following the hearing to explain what happened every day. So if you guys go on YouTube and subscribe to the Canadian Constitution Foundation's YouTube channel, you can watch uh, my daily summaries of, of the hearing uh, that will take place over three days in Ottawa. I dare you to say under oath that you miss Ottawa. I don't think anyone could ever uh, do such a oh, thing. Is there a... I'm not going to be doing that. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Is there a, a trial date set or a, a time you're anticipating it being? Yeah, so it's, it's the hearing date is April. Uh, let me check my calendar. Uh, April 3rd, 4th, and 5th. Now that is subject to change. These things ch can change, but that's currently uh, when I'm planning on being in Ottawa. All right. Well, we'll look forward to that. Christine Van Gyne from the Canadian Constitution Foundation. Always a pleasure and keep up the great work. It was great chatting with you, Andrew. All right. Thanks very much, uh, Christine Van Gyne. And you can also watch her show on the News Forum in which she breaks down a lot of these uh, really key legal discussions in Canada. And I know she was like uh, plugging away in the studio on Friday when I, I know she'd rather be sitting down with a nice big 2,000-page uh, tome instead. Well, maybe not, but uh, it's a labor of love, I'm sure. Uh, let's talk about this in a, in a little bit more detail here. Well, not, not more detail, but I'd say the bigger picture of this. And, and where I approach this, not as a lawyer, but as someone who's followed the convoy, who's followed the fallout of the convoy, and who followed the emergency commission in the fall. And I know that just to set this aside here, there's been a ton of discussion online about uh, this alleged uh, political or familial connection between uh, Commissioner Paul Rouleau and Justin Trudeau. And let me just say it does not exist. Uh, there is no familial connection. Uh, the purported connection of uh, would have Paul Rouleau, who's like 10 years older than Justin Trudeau, somehow be his uncle by marriage. So it was already a bit of a tenuous connection. It was supposed to, I don't even want to repeat it because it's not true. But the, the connection that you've seen is entirely a conflation of two different Rouleau families. So that connection isn't there. And, and the view that I take on this 
is that you can find enough problems in the actual report if you read it. You don't need to invent new ones. I mean, the, I think that the commissioner's report is flawed because of what the commissioner's report says, not because Paul Rouleau was, you know, once stood on the sidewalk when within, you know, 50 meters was someone else and that made a conflict of interest. No, you can judge it based on the merits and find enough issues there to poke holes in this narrative. You don't need to invent new ones. So I don't like this tendency tendency for people to just immediately flee to corruption when you don't need corruption to go up against ideology, which is enough of a driving force, I, I think. And uh, the other aspect of this is that this is not Justin Trudeau uh, pulling the strings on this. You can't say the fix was in from the beginning. Canadians heard evidence on both sides. It did come down to, I think, a very razor thin margin. And ultimately, the commissioner sided with deference more than he sided with what I would say the letter of the statute is. So again, we don't need to create a conspiracy. We can just condemn it on its merits and do exactly what I'm doing on this show, which is work through with someone who knows the law very well, who knows the report, who knows the case, and explain exactly why it is wrong. So we'll be following the federal court case. We'll be following the hearing in April and we'll be following whatever comes next. But I also want to tell people that I'm very pessimistic about this. And I was kind of pessimistic about the Public Order Emergency Commission, if I'm being perfectly frank. I got increasingly optimistic as it went on because I was watching this and saying, if Canadians are seeing this, then there is going to be no way whatsoever they can take Justin Trudeau's side. And unfortunately, uh, the way that Canadians viewed this did not really translate to what became the final report. But the facts are still out there. The documents are still out there. People like Eva Chipiuk, a, a lawyer who's uh, worked with the convoy organizers, formerly with the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms, uh, she has been doing a tremendous job at pulling out and continuing to tweet out documents that in some cases didn't get nearly the attention they deserved during the hearings. Documents, for example, from uh, Superintendent Pat Morris of the OPP talking about how OPP intelligence found no threat to violence. They saw nothing that was not a peaceful, lawful protest. And there were so many examples of that that I think we need to hold on to. Testimony that was incredibly valuable because it revealed that they were talking about feelings of violence, not real violence, that you had uh, police that were really throwing the federal government under the bus, saying, no, we had a plan. And the federal government saying, ah, uh, yeah, but I didn't like that plan. Justin Trudeau at one point said, yeah, I didn't like uh, the plan that I saw by police. Did you see the plan? Well, no, but I heard about it. And it's like, you decided... The Emergencies Act was the path you wanted to go through without even looking at the plan that law enforcement was saying could have given you the same objective without going through that extreme process, that last resort, not one of the last resorts, but in law, the last resort for emergency management, wartime legislation. I cannot stress that enough. And even if the Emergencies Act broadens the use of the act beyond what the more measures did, it is still the bill that you would invoke in the time of war. Sure, a different section, but it is wartime legislation, which gives you an indication of the caliber of emergency we're talking about here when the Emergencies Act is to be brought in. So I said a moment ago, I was pessimistic at the beginning. I'm very pessimistic about the court case. Sometimes I think the process can be cathartic and the process can be a way that we bring some truth and bring some sunlight to this. But I also have not seen from the Canadian judiciary in general, certainly through COVID, exactly what I would call a ringing endorsement for liberty. And in Canada, this is going to be a tremendous problem. So I go back to the political dimension of this, the political angle, and how important it is to educate Canadians, to continue to talk about this, and to, if I can be so bold, take the wisdom that I tried to put forward in my newsletter last week of never forgetting this Emergencies Act, never forgetting the last three years. We are now in the fourth year of the COVID era. And while most of it is behind us, these fights are now continuing. The possibility for accountability, for justice, for truth, for transparency, it's only coming up now. And we cannot let that window slip away.
And when I wrote that and talked about it on my show, I had people saying, yeah, I'm on board, but what does that entail? Is it writing letters to my member of parliament? Is it writing letters to the editor in the newspaper? To which I say, yes, call your member of parliament. Actually go and talk to them. Don't be abusive. Don't harass. Certainly never take out your frustrations on members of parliament's office staff. I think that's a a terrible thing to do. They're people that... to your members of parliament and i'm very curious one-on-one privately how a lot of liberal members of parliament would speak about this outside of ottawa face to face with a constituent especially if they don't know if you i mean don't go in wearing your we the fringe hoodie with a canadian flag on your car because that might give you away but but if you go in and actually put forward some earnest complaints i don't know how many might break that red line that the Liberals have had. I mean, just for example, uh, this week, Anthony Housefather, who I've disagreed with on a number of things, the Liberal Member of Parliament from Montreal, tweeted out that uh, Roald Dahl, who's the uh, late author who's being cancelled now and his books are being posthumously edited to, you know, make women more empowered or something like that. I, this is a book about a giant peach that you can live in. Uh, I mean, what, some of what Roald Dahl has written about. So I really don't think realism is within the parameters of what we need to strive for in Roald Dahl. But anyway, Anthony Housefather tweets that Roald Dahl's work and all work should be read as it was originally written. That is like heretical to the left today. So a little bit of independent thought there. I congratulate him for it. Uh, Joel Lightbound from Quebec, we know, has famously criticized the Liberal government's handling of COVID. Uh, Nathaniel Erskine-Smith, a very far-left member of the Liberal caucus, uh, went along with it, but not without expressing on the record his criticisms. So there are some Liberals that, again, I'm not going to hold them up as being uh, these virtuous uh, bulwarks for liberty here, but they, I think, might be teetering on the edge of realizing this was not something they should ever have done. And and certainly the NDP, I think it's a tremendous shame that they've gone along with something that will be used against their pet causes in the future, without a doubt, because now it's been out of the box. It's been taken out of the box. The glass case has been smashed with the hammer. The big red button has been hit. And now federal governments have this tool in their arsenal a heck of a lot more readily than they had it before Justin Trudeau. So we're going to put this to bed right now and revisit it in the future as necessary. Let's talk about O Canada, though, which I believe it's still called O Canada. Who knows? They keep changing the lyrics now. Uh, Julie Black, the Canadian singer, R&B singer, tremendously talented. She's she's Canadian, so she's not like a household name, but she's uh, very well known in certain circles and, again, is, is very talented. I've liked uh, some of her songs. She does a cover of a, that great Attic James number whose name escapes me right now. Uh, But she decided she wanted to do a little bit of ad-libbing when she was singing the national anthem at a, a no, not a football game. Uh, See, I knew I was going to do something like this. A basketball game, NBA, National Baseball Alliance or something, uh, an NBA game in Utah. And this is what she sang in those opening lines. Oh, Canada, our home on a native land. Our home on, she, she enunciates that word as if to say, you better make sure you hear what I'm saying. Our home on native land. Now, that is not actually the lyric, if you are unaware. The lyric is our home and native land, because it is not native in the noun sense as Canada's native peoples. It's native in the the adjective sense, uh, as if to say it is our home and native land. A very clear meaning. But she wants to make the political point. It's our home on native land. Land. It is now a preposition that that opening line needed. She's very proud of herself. You can see her smirking at the camera there. And normally politicizing the national anthem because she's making a political point. Uh, she's even said in interviews in the, uh, after the fact, quote, I sang the facts, unquote. 
She said to CBC, we are walking, breathing, living, experiencing life on native land, on indigenous land. Now, she was in Utah. Now, Utah, of course, was once home to uh, indigenous nations like most other parts of North America. But uh, again, it's a weird place to stage this sort of protest because, you know, the Utah... Uh, people don't actually care about Canadian Indigenous policy, I would suspect. But uh, our home on native land, she makes the point, and is given accolades by the media here. I just want to give you a few examples of the response. So CBC does that glowing interview, I sang the facts, they say. Uh, what else do we have? Toronto star Julie's Black, Julie Black's national anthem is making headlines. What would it take to make the change official? So the Toronto Star is saying, yeah, we really like how she named those uh, lyrics. We need to uh, make those part of the official lyrics. CBC Kids uh, has this piece, because you can never propagandize enough to children. Julie Black recognized Indigenous land when she sang O Canada. So we're talking about this being virtuous. Uh, Yahoo News does a roundup here of big reactions to the lyric swap. And oddly, all of the reactions seem to be positive, and the ones that are negative are just from a bunch of randos on Twitter. So everyone in the media is coming out with a tremendous display of support for Julie Black. Indigenous leaders are saying, yeah, you go, girl. Uh, it's funny, though. I remember a few years ago when it was a lot less popular to make a lyric change at a sporting event to the national anthem. Just ask Remigio Pereira of the Canadian Tenors. We're all brothers and sisters, all lives matter to the great. Now, I will say that there's a bit of a difference in changing one word that could be mistaken for the original word in general and just writing in a whole line that has nothing to do with anything. So I think, lyrically speaking, Julie Black wins over uh, Remigio Pereira of the Canadian tenors, who are now the tenors because they decided that the Canadian part was holding them back. So they got rid of Remigio Pereira. They got rid of the Canadian. They're just the tenors now. They've added a new one. Again, very talented singers. But this guy ruined his had his career ruined this guy was canceled he was kicked out of the band had his career just decimated and he's never really rebounded because he dared to sing all lives matter in the national anthem and if you listen to how he described that this is not a guy who was making an anti-black point this is a guy who was saying that we need to love everybody he was making some hippie peace and love point point. and as i said at the time i thought it was stupid you don't grandstand in that way certainly not during the national anthem and I say the same thing to Julie Black, but I'd be remiss to not point out the utter double standard between what happens when a guy makes a claim like Remigio Pereira did and when a woman like Julie Black does and aligns with a cause that is very much on vogue right now. And we see that the rules are that you can politicize the anthem only if your thoughts are right. If you are one of the woke set, you can do it. You can get away with it. And you know what? Your career is probably going to be better. I was when the Julie Black, I interviewed Julie Black many years ago, believe it or not. She was a very lovely woman. And when this whole thing happened, I was uh, trying to just go through, hey, what are those big songs of hers? I just wanted a bit of a primer. And I looked her up on YouTube. And on YouTube, like almost the entire, I'm going to do it again for you right now, just to make sure I'm, I'm not leading you astray here. But if you type in Julie Black with the proper spelling, two L's, uh, on YouTube, the first hit is a Shopify ad. So we go past that one. It's her performance of the National Anthem, uh, then a piece from CTV about the National Anthem, and then, hey, this show this show here is number three. Well, that's good. Good for True North on there. We've uh, penetrated the, the YouTube rankings. And then a city news piece about changing the National Anthem, uh, then an interview she did four years ago with Global, and a bunch of other things that have nothing to do with her music. So you actually have to get down, like halfway down the page, to get a Julie Black song, which is to say that she's getting a lot more intrigue for her changing of the lyrics to O Canada than she has for her music in a little while. And again, that's not an indictment of her music. It's that now we are talking about this person who wanted to use her platform to make a point, but if she did this in any other forum, no one would have cared. 
If she just tweeted out, you know what? We really need to talk about indigenous issues. No one would have cared. It would have been another celebrity mouthing off. If she had just written a letter to parliament and said, hey, I know you guys changed the lyrics to the national anthem a few years ago. Clearly you're open to changing the lyrics. I've got a lyrical suggestion for you. I'm a songwriter. I'm a Juno winner. You should listen to what I have to say. And they would have taken it, looked at it and said, oh, okay, fine. Yeah, next. So she hijacks a sporting event, which... Again, I don't really care about it. I'm not one of these people that think sporting events are these sacred places. I watched the Super Bowl, and that is the only sporting event of the year I watch because I enjoy football, but not enough to watch all the other games every year. I'm wearing right now a Talladega shirt because I went to a NASCAR race with my father and brother, uh, which I did not because I had a love of NASCAR, but because I had a love for my father and brother. So uh, I am not one of these people who's offended because she ruined a sporting event. I'm, I'm one of these people who believes you should be called out when you have this utterly hypocritical approach to when we accept politicization of the national anthem. And I, this is not Justin Trudeau's fault, but I think it is the fault of people like Justin Trudeau who have decided that Canadian symbols do not matter. Remember that Justin Trudeau flew the Canadian flag at half mass for the better part of half a year because he just held in such contempt the idea of Canada, the idea of Canadian pride, the idea of any sort of Canadian nationalism, and didn't care about it. It was a lot easier to pander to the woke mob by keeping the national flag and the Canadian flag down indefinitely than it was to have a real discussion about issues that matter to people in this country. And the national anthem is the same. When um, the former member of parliament, who's now passed away, uh, decided he wanted to change the lyrics to uh, in all of us command instead of in all thy sons command, we decided that we're just going to change the lyrics. It doesn't matter that it doesn't make grammatical sense. We have to be gender neutral. So tradition does not matter. Canadian symbols do not matter. And how else are you going to have a country rally around a national identity if we've decided that all the markers of our national identity are things that we're to be ashamed of? That our national anthem is something that should be changed on the fly because we want to make a ham-fisted political statement about Indigenous people without actually offering any solutions. So one CBC thing that they did that I really enjoyed was a bit, I can't play it on air because it's copyrighted and I'd have to play the whole thing. So it's not a fair dealing, but it's a, a bit they did in a show called the Baroness Von Sketch Show or something. And it was about land acknowledgements. And there's someone in a movie theater that's doing a land acknowledgement and someone in the audience says, oh, sh should we leave then? I mean, you just said it was not our land, so should we go? And then the person at the theater is saying, no, 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 I mean, it's the theater's land now. And then the person in the audience says, oh, but do just, you know, a little bit of our, can, our ticket price go to Indigenous people? They're like, no, it, it goes to the movie theater. But it was a really great example of how virtue signaling has become the norm in a way that is completely unquestioning. And it comes at a cost, though. It comes at a cost because all of these things uh, become a very lazy way of making a point without actually contributing to anything. So uh, I don't know if Julie Black has really taken a keen awareness of Indigenous issues, and I don't know if she's decided to contribute some of her earnings, such as they are, to uh, Indigenous drinking water. I don't know if she's lobbied the government for uh, Indigenous changes. I don't know if she's advocated for the abolition of the Indian Act. And that's not her job. She's a singer. I don't expect those things of her. But now she's decided that she's the one that has to solve these issues. If you want to get in there and solve the issues, maybe do something more than slipping a two-letter word into the national anthem to get your 15 milliseconds of fame. We've got to end things there. When we return tomorrow, we'll have more of Canada's most irreverent talk show here on True North. This is The Andrew Lawton Show. Thank you, God bless, and good day to you all. Thanks for listening to The Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.